Hey folks, this is Craig. Thank you once again for listening to Acid Horizon. On today's episode, we have Todd McGowan to talk about his book, Emancipation After Hegel, Achieving a Contradictory Revolution. In this episode, we are going to explore Hegel's notion of contradiction. We intend to challenge a common conception of Hegel's system of logic as a closed totality and instead reveal it as an open system. With the help of our supporters, our patrons, we have been able to take this podcast to a new level. Over the coming months, I will be working on this endeavor in a full-time capacity, also developing some new channels, including a new YouTube channel. <laughs> if you would like to subscribe at the $1 level or more, find us on Patreon. We also have blogs. We have a merch store, too. And we host monthly seminars that you can find on our Patreon page. In the meantime, let's discuss the case for contradiction in Hegel with Todd McGowan. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we're joined by University of Vermont professor Todd McGowan, author of such works as Universality and Identity Politics, Capitalism and Desire, Only a Joke Can Save Us, and today's focus his 2019 work, Emancipation After Hegel. Todd also co-hosts the podcast, Why Theory, with Ryan Angley, a show that we encourage you to listen to, especially if you're intrigued by our central topic today, which is Hegel's logic and the emancipatory political ontology of contradiction. Todd, welcome to Asset Horizon. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Also on the show today, I have Adam, Will, and Matt is back with us. So welcome, everyone. So, Todd, let's begin. What precisely was the problem that you saw in Hegelian discourse that pushed you to write this book? Well, the main thing I saw was this idea of a matrix for understanding Hegel of thesis, antithesis, synthesis that I really wanted to push back against. But, you know, most Hegel scholars obviously didn't have that as their model. So that wasn't the, I mean, that was part, that was sort of looming in the background. But but in terms of Hegelian scholars, one thing that I noticed was there was still the sense that the trajectory of Hegel's thought is toward the solution and elimination of contradiction. So even, even I think, really good Hegelian thinkers, to my mind, that who I'm really indebted to, like Gillian Rose, Catherine Malibu, to a lesser extent, maybe, Robert Pippin, they still, they still, this, they share this idea that Hegel's trajectory is toward solution or resolution, and 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 that was, I I guess that was for me the thing that really tipped me over into writing an actual book on Hegel was that I, I thought, well, what if what if the gambit was the opposite? What if the gambit was we actually drive deeper into contradiction as we move forward in Hegel's logic or phenomenology or even philosophy of right. And so that was the, that was really the, 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 the fundamental wager of the book. And that's what got me to write it. I mean, I had certain other little ideas about Hegel, but that was the one that once I kind of came to that, then I thought, well, I have to put this into a book. There's actually a section from the book here that I'd like to read out loud that I think encapsulates the thrust of your thesis on contradiction. You say, a dialectical advance, as Hegel conceives it, is a step in the direction of absolute contradiction, not a progressive moment toward the elimination of contradiction. The unity that occurs at the end of each dialectical process does not do away with contradiction, but enacts a reconciliation with it. Rather than synthesize the two opposing positions, what Hegel calls unity involves the recognition that the position is opposed fundamentally to itself, that it involves what it is not. Unity enshrines contradiction as the constitutive form that identity takes. Contradiction both undermines and defines the identity of the subject. I I think that was really nice for me. Somebody who's not a Hegel scholar, but of course, always running past Hegel critiques, summaries, commentaries. That was just a really nice little kernel. 
Thanks. Usually when I, I encounter something that I've written, I absolutely hate it. But that, that I think that's fine. <laughs> like I, I, I could tolerate listening to that. So I, I think that that's, that's fine. I still agree with it, I guess. So It seems that you're arguing that contradiction in Hegel's philosophy presents Hegel as a kind of open system rather than a closed system. And so maybe you could talk more about the concept of unity or the good in Hegel vis-a-vis the, the, the notion of the law of identity and how invoking the law of identity as Ayn Rand did, which I thought was an interesting example in the book, could be more pernicious, for example, than violating the law of non-contradiction. Maybe you could say some things about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, that, to me, that's really kind of where the rubber hits the road in the in the in, in Hegel's project that that he was really the first in a in a in a convincing way to break from the law of identity because he saw it I think you know he didn't he wouldn't have said this just because capitalism was such an incipient system at the time and hadn't been fully developed but I think he he would have seen it as in, integral to the logic of capital and to the destructive, I think, logic of capital. And that, so the, the notion for Hegel is that every identity always involves what it's not. And so you can't, what's interesting to me is that you, so you can't separate the identity from what it's not. And part of that has to do with time, right? So things are always as they're, as they're in, because they're temporal things, because we're temporal beings, we're constantly changing and we're constantly becoming other and taking in otherness. It's interesting that, you know, contemporary physics and, and physics in the 20th century would, would, would show Hegel is right. You know, that no, mm. there's no identity that's just itself, right? Like every identity is constantly shedding. Every entity is constantly shedding and taking in molecules even. So, so it, it, obviously Hegel didn't know that, but I think it's, it's an interesting empirical kind of confirmation of what he saw happening logically. That is, that even the conception of an identity, he thinks, has to rely on what's other to it and and is constantly engaging with becoming what's other. And if it, if, if it doesn't have that, then it loses its identity. And so that so so for him, the what what he calls unity just means that that recognition of the of the dependence on what's other to it so it's a it's also i think a a, a phenomenally anti-fascist philosophy right like the mm. the fascist absolutely depends upon something conceiving something as absolutely other to it right like that that this other is the threatened is threatening but is is not part of me right i uh. can't be part of me and i think that's hegel absolutely destroys that way of thinking so once you think hegelianly you can't you don't encounter absolute others, right? You can't, every otherness is all, you all, you're always involved in it. And I think for that to me was the big, one of the big important points about his, his thinking. I mean, absolutely. I, my favorite thing about this book is its critique of identity, because especially given the sort of, I mean, my main focus is uh, left and right Hegelianism. And I think you really articulate well how in the right Hegelianism, the point was to make everything conform to the identity, which it seemingly has in the system. And left againism, people like, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm personally a scholar of Stern. I think he avoids this trap a little bit, but Feuerbach, absolutely. He wants to identify man with the sensibility that he finds in Hegel, which is sort of the, the alienated concept of God. And you could even see this in the, the university reaction at the time to Hegel's death, where they, you know, reimposed that great philosopher of identity shelling into the place to reimpose the destruction of the state. But even some other left Hegelians like, um, I mean, I see this uh, emancipation after Hegel. I see it almost like the uh, the trumpet of the last judgment against Hegel, as Bruno Bauer's sense. Because I've been reading that recently, and, he, and Bauer talks about the destruction of substantiality, which is underlying simply Hegel's explaining of the logic of all of these processes of representation, religion, um, political um, order. To what extent, in terms of left Hegelianism versus right Hegelianism, which this dialectic has failed to capture the movement of Hegel's own logic in the ways in which he exceeds them in being not only a thinker of radicality that's beyond them, but in a way that uh, avoids the pitfalls of certain revolutionary logics, for example, of, you know, uh, Bauer saying that one day all contradiction will be resolved in the critical system where everyone is critical and everyone is aligning themselves with self-consciousness. Feuerbach will be imposed humanism as the new goal, and even early Marx in the, well, even later Marx in terms of non-contradiction of uh, the post-catalyst era. 
I think I cite that line from the contribution to the critique of political economy when he says the bourgeois bourgeois society is the last antagonistic social form, right? Like that that that's one of the things I was pushing against. And I think that I think you're absolutely right that what I would call something like the disillusion of Hegel's thought into right and left, it it, it ends up taking away. I think it, it it certainly preserves a radical kernel, but I think. It's interesting because the the things that 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 were dismissed as right, I feel like, had a way of 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 were sort of a safeguard against some of the th- some of the ways in which the left went off the track. And I that's what was to me most appealing about about Hegel was that you know it seemed like universally just true that left Hegelianism was right, <laughs> right in the sense of correct, you know, politically and historically. And and obviously, I don't I, I wasn't trying to re invigorate right-wing hegelianism in any way but what but what i guess the the things that were dismissed in hegel's thought i felt like provided this important thing that could contribute to a leftist project and i and i mm. you know in a way that hegel i'm sure himself i don't know that he would have conceived it that way it's interesting because he was he was certainly conscious of how he's on the verge of getting into i mean he's thought of he's dismissed as this prussian state philosopher but he was conscious of constantly maybe I'm going to get in trouble with the state. So he and and his students, mm. he was constantly defending them against, you know, state problems. This, I think, speaks to what you're talking about, about this right left divide. So in the late 1820s, he comes out against free speech on on the university campus. And you're like, well, what? that's clearly this right wing deviation. But the free speech movement on campus was exactly like it is today. It's like it was a right wing movement saying, oh, this campuses are dominated by political correctness. Mm. We need free speech, which was, you know, nationalist speech. So it, so even there, I feel like there's a way in which he's he's he, the, the split kind of does violence to this this unique radicality that his thought has. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add something onto that, I mean, in terms of the, the opening to the philosophy of right, he's criticizing, I think, Freeze for the the Wartburg Festival, this nationalist festival of, you know, you know, I see all of this friendly brotherhood of Germans things, and it's actually just an anti-Semitic book burning league. It's, right, right. Exa- you know, this- no, it's exactly like, <laughs> like his people dismiss his opposition to Freeze as this kind of personal vendetta, mm. but it's not at all. It's a clear anti-nationalist. I mean, to me, I talk about this in the book. To me, the championing of Napoleon's invasion of Germany is one of the great like anti-nationalist positions any philosopher has taken. You know, like his own home was was burned down and he's still in favor of it, you know, like because he so fears German nationalism. Mm. The death of the third Rome, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I just just a sort of really small question, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. A moment ago, you were talking about sort of the almost the anti-fascism of Hegel's, let me, let me say, critique of identity, and we, we know what you mean there. And you, you mentioned how it, how it changes, you know, uh, it undermines the fascist conception of sort of the organic unity of the nation state, etc. Because once we understand that our identity always binds us in certain relations towards the other and involves my identity in that, it just destabilizes the whole vision. I was just wondering, just out of surely out of interest. Um, what do you make of Axel Honneth's more recent work on the politics of recognition? Because that's sort of following in a line of the Frankfurt School's sort of return to Hegel, I suppose. And he also seems to see that it's the thing that it's very key to understanding. I mean, I think he calls it the moral grammar of social conflict, doesn't he? Recognition, um, the struggle for recognition and respect and so on. Um, would you see that as sort of part of where you'd like to see Hegelian sort of thought, I suppose, go, um, or is that a little bit further away from your politics? Yeah, it's a good question. It's it's a little like I think to me that the the Frankfurt school is kind of deviation. It's part of the left, sort of part of this left wing Hegelianism. But what's interesting is this is a case where left and right come. I mean, I don't know that they would, or this is maybe left and moderate Hegelianism because I don't I, I don't think I would call Pippin and Robert Brandom right-wing Hegelians. So they're, they're liberal Hegelians and, and they're completely invested in the politics of recognition. And I think to my mind, and it's, what's interesting is all these people are incredibly critical of Alexander Kojev and his, his anthropologization of Hegel, uh, if that's a word, but what's interesting is they're equally invested in recognition. Like, and, and, and that was, that's Kojev's watchword, you know? So 
I find it very strange because for, it seems to me like the whole point of the, the master servant dialectic is that recognition always ends up in a failure, right? Like that, mm. that, that seems to me Hegel's absolute yeah. point that rec that we can never reach a society of mutual recognition and that we have to grasp the failure of recognition. So I think on it, I've read that book and I, I feel like he kind of, I think there's a debt to Habermas, you know, and I think that that, I feel like that that's, that, that Habermas is very invested in that idea that we can, that, underlying even the most you know tendentious and and violent relations there's this ideal of of mutual recognition and i i, th I just i don't think that's true i think that instead there's a split a split a, a rupture that's underlying that and i don't think i don't think recognition can get over that and so i think and i don't think recognition can be the basis for a, a social compact yeah, I mean, I remember reading, I have not really seriously studied Hegel, I don't think since I was uh, just finishing up my undergrad degree, but I remember being really interested in the master-slave dialectic and also the way that Kojev sort of uses that and spins off a very different sort of Hegel with it. I was always, and maybe, maybe it is just purely, a, you know, my not understanding Hegel very well. When I read about, you know, the, the process of that dialectic of master and slave, I noticed that what you pointed out was that it ends in the failure in a certain way, right? It doesn't quite square the circle at the end, right? It doesn't show how this might resolve the contradiction lead to recognition. It, it's the conclusion of it is that neither really get the recognition that either wants. <laughs> Right, right. What's fascinating is so Robert Brandom wrote this book called A Spirit of Trust, which is a commentary on the phenomenology, which is all about achieving a community of mutual recognition. I mean, that's the whole point of it. But what's fascinating to me is that Hegel never gets to, that's never the end point of any single one of Hegel's works, right? So his his philosophy is never oh, I'm going to give you the main part in the middle or at the beginning. <laughs> like his his the whatever claim he's making is always what he comes to at the end. And what he comes to at the end, what he calls absolute in all these different forms is always a split. There's always like that, that, so even absolute knowing in the phenomenology is the absolute. So spirit knows itself and it knows the limit of itself, right? Like, so, so there's always this, still this cut or this divide within this contradiction within that can't be reconciled, that can't be overcome. And so I think that's miss, and I think that's what you point out is exactly right. Like at the end of the master slave dialectic, there's still this opening. I, I I love Kojev. I think he's the great thinker of the 20th century, but I still think that his reading of Hegel is just is is wrong. Like it just he's just wrong, but it's productive. It's incredible. But I, I do I do think he misses that. You know that the the failure. I mean, if we call it Kojevian philosophy, then fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I don't think he wanted to do that though. Like I think he really wanted to say I'm recovering something in Hegel. And what's fascinating to me is that that spurs this entire anti-Hegelian French, like second half of the 20th century in France is all in response to a certain image of Hegel, which is completely not true. So I've always wanted in my mind, right, this, oh, maybe it would have happened differently, like Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, they all would have thought something different if Kojev didn't, didn't exist. Yeah, in a certain sense, it almost feels like the response to and like Foucault is careful with this in his in his lectures on history at the College de France, where he almost wants to separate Hegel from dialectical history. And I wonder if in a certain sense, that's because of this, this difference on the function of both the master slave notion of the dialectic and sort of the more open interpretation that we get in Hippolyte. I almost wonder if in a certain sense, there's not only a split that you start with an identification of like a split between left and right Hegelianisms, but then you also start to expose these other splits in Hegelian philosophy uh, as it pertains to like the process, like uh, the, the process of dialectic. And can you just speak a little bit to this, this notion of like progressive history um, that we get in the early 20th century? particularly as it pertains to like different Marxist discourses, like in the wake of Marx, because part of part of this issue, too, is like this, what we're for the purpose of this conversation going to deem is like a, a an error also leads to like totalizing discourses that end up constructing Stalinism. <laughs> so can you just speak to some of the, the pitfalls and risks that come with this understanding of the dialectic? 
Yeah, I think yeah, that's a great question. I mean, to really think about the difference between Hegel and Marx and in, in history, like and and those and 20th century Marxism versus Hegel and, and the way they understand history, I think you have to see that this. You know, there's this great German word. We don't really have a, gr- a good translation for it, but it's it comes from Freud, Nachtreglichkeit, retroactivity and or retrospectivity. And Hegel, all, Hegel firmly thinks that history is always the history of the present, right? Like it's always told backwards. And we can only, the point we get to is the point we're at. So the, what's brought us to that point can only be understood from the point that we are at right now. So I think that's completely different than Marx because Marx is trying to tell history. I mean, maybe not Marx himself, but certainly strands of Marxism, the main ones, are trying to, to tell history in a progressive way. And his and Hegel's telling it in the opposite direction. So to me, that's the big thing, right? Like he he sees a dialectical unfolding, but it's only at the end of the dialectical unfolding that it becomes evident. It's not like you can look out and see where things are going because you're always telling history from the from the end point, whatever point you're at, it's an end point. And so I think that, to me, that's one of the biggest, you know, a lot of people say Hegel introduced history into philosophy, but they don't say that other part, that he introduced history only, not in a progressive way, only told from the present, right? And so to me, that's really the crucial difference. And, and, and I think when you tell it in this progressive way, I think you're right, like, that's how you open it up to, I mean, I, I say in the book something like, look, if, if, if it was true that we could actually achieve a, a non-contradictory future, then, then fine, like Stalin, fine. Like it's maybe worth it to sacrifice 13 mil, whatever many million people. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but I think like you could make the argument at least. I mean, Merleau-Ponty actually makes this argument in a little book called Humanism and Terror. So I don't think it's crazy, but I think once you take this Hegelian perspective, then that's out the window, that line of thinking. Yeah, and I think the quote, I think the people throw, out, throw around from Hegel, you know, the thing we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. But what they don't include is that Hegel thinks that's a good thing. We don't. I, I know, I know, I know. It's, 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 that is a fascinating point, Adam. So I was, I was living in Texas for my sins, and I, uh, I, somebody wrote a column in the paper, and they quoted this line from Hegel about, and they, they were talking about some, U.S. intervention and how we 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 should have intervened because we we haven't learned the lesson of history mm. and 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 I I just I was I was apoplectic because they just completely cut off for the second point where Hegel goes and we are absolutely right to not learn the lesson of history because <laughs> history has no lessons to teach us so I wrote this letter to the editor I'm like don't you think if you're going to maybe use a quote book you ought to go back to the original source and find out what it really says so yeah I think that 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 line gets cut off all the time. Mm precisely to Hegel's detriment, right? I mean, people say that Hegel gives a history of consciousness and of phenomenology of spirit, but essentially, I think this aspect of failure, which um, which Zizek brings up first, really, and is carried forward into this, you know, failure from your work as constitutive contradiction, and I tend to link it up with um, Catherine Malibu's work on plasticity, although going back to the future of Hegel, one of the things I'd like in terms of for lack of an awful term, synthesizing <laughs> in um, sort of what, what I've been writing in my, my PhD thesis is that contradiction becomes kind of the motor of plasticity. And it becomes the motor of the plasticity that breaks down form, allows form to fail, but in a way that sort of renews it to inaugurate new forms. And that's, you know, what keeps contradiction going. And you can see this definitely in the phenomenology of spirit, because essentially it's the end of a history of total failures. And then spirit tries to identify of itself with its own representation so much when it becomes Christian, it says, you know, ich bin Christ, I am Christ, and then it kills itself, and then it dies, and then representation is dead, and then it has nowhere to start from, apart from the size of logic. And I think this this notion of failure is so crucial, especially when we think of the idea of the future and how we have a politics, not of identity, but in some of the political implications of this failure. But I guess my question is, what is the political implications of contradiction not in terms of only within Hegel's system and how he resolves it through, say, the monarch, but also what it means after the system. Because I remember you, you talk about um, Catherine's work in terms of this economy of absolute loss. You know, we, we are free for new potentialities after we've seen that all of these failures. Well, now we know. We know what not to do. 
in terms of trying to realize identity or cost, we can sort of repeat these in new ways. I mean, is there a new way, a new form of social organization, not necessarily predicted by Hegel, but opened up in the space after Hegel? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I mean, uh, Catherine's book was Im- really important for me. I think it's a, it's one of the great. I mean, there's this whole new wave of books. I mean, probably led by Slavoj, as you mentioned. Mm. But then, uh, Catherine, Rebecca Come, yeah, you know, um, Frank Ruda has written one. So there's there's a lot of people that are really Rosia Zambrana, reason stuff, yeah, right. Adrian Johnston too. Um, so so that so I think that there's a whole wave of that, and I think you really hit on the thing that 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 the grasping the necessity of failure or the necessity of contradiction, either way you put Mm. it, I think does open up this. uh, uh, And I think Hegel actually provides the model for it when he's thinking of the monarch, right? Like, obviously we don't, there's no, I, I, the idea of returning to a monarch is not, is not appealing, Mm. but there are certain, I think there's certain, we could think of certain ways in which we install that contradiction. Like, you know, I find it very appealing. Kojin Karatani has this notion of the, uh, like we would draw lots to pick the leader and then everything else is democratically decided, but the, the, the actual leader of the country is drawn by lots. And essentially that's the Hegelian monarch. Cause that's what he likes about the monarch is it's basically just purely contingent this one position. And so I think allowing for some, that, that, allowing for that ultimate contingency within whatever social form develops, I think is that seems to me to be absolutely crucial. And that's one way to think how, how contradiction can be enshrined. Yeah, I'm really a fan of your defense of the Hegelian monarch, because what it does is, is it stops the demos of democracy from becoming substantialized. You, know, you have capital T, capital P, the people, and then you get the people's Google, like the people's. I really love that, what you just said, because I, I was just on a, a, a talk with, and with a Marxist who was very critical of my work on Hegel and, and and especially critical of the defense of the monarch. And, and I, I kind of think that it's a part of this defense against fascism, right? Like part of, it's part of a way to say, look, that, that social excess has to have a point. Mm. It has to have a point. Otherwise you get Trump. That's to me, one of his most important political ideas. In view of your rendering of Hegel's notion of contradiction as an open system, and it being inherently a critique of either Marx or a way that Marxists have interpreted Hegel, vis-a-vis the way that you use Freud and the concepts of Freud as a way to shore up Hegel's notion of contradiction, do you see that in some sense, and this is, a, this is going to be one of those controversial questions, is there more revolutionary potential in importing Freud into Hegel than bringing Marx back into Hegelianism to articulate perhaps a politics of desire. Yeah, I actually do. Like, I think that there is, obviously, Slavoj has been very important for this, bringing psychoanalysis and Hegel together and, and, and just allowing people to see the way, the link. But then what, what what's amazing to me is the way in which Freud's notion of death drive gets, it's almost... It, once you see the link to Hegel and and contradiction, it's almost it's it's hard not to it's hard to unsee it. It's like one of those things you can't you can't unsee. And so I do think that there is a. What's interesting to me is that the the failures of leftist Freudianism, leftist psychoanalysis in the 20th century, are obviously not as bloody as the failures of of Marxism, but they're 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 in a way similar, right? Like they they want to Wilhelm Reich, Artie Lang, they want to unleash this this absolute vital potential and they think if we do that then we can overcome we can overcome limits we can jouir sans entrave right we can we can enjoy without hindrances and that that i think that's the that's the real way in which psychoanalysis and hegel come together around this idea that the limit or the obstacle is the condition of possibility for the social structure it's kind of what we're talking about it with the monarch and for the, the individual subject's own way of comporting itself and enjoying itself, right? Like the the limit isn't the barrier to that to your enjoyment; it's the condition of possibility for it. So I think I think yeah, like to me, bringing Freud, like Freud has totally been abandoned by the left for certain reasons, I think. And understanding the link between Hegel and Freud is for that reason very important. Yeah, I just want to add a question about this notion of vitality, talking about, you know, uh, Reich of the Orgo and Lang with the sort of uh, getting people away from the family and stopping themselves from becoming schizophrenic from these family expectations. 
And it's 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 weird because I I try to think of contradiction sometimes as a kind of vitality, but it's not vitality in the means of what people think of as this purely positive force of life pushing itself against all boundaries, life always winning against the object. If anything, contradiction seems to be more like oxygen at the same time as it sets the limits of that which it conditions as life. It's slowly combusting us all the time. <laughs> it's slowly setting us all on fire, but at the same time, we only die of ourselves. We need it to, to breathe. And Hegel says this himself in the science of logic, in a sense, not in the oxygen sense, but in the sense of uh, the contradiction as life. My sort of questions around contradiction as a vitality is, is, are we ultimately condemned to repeating contradiction in new ways or in terms of, I mean, you mentioned in the book about Trump, for example, how you have to start with non-contradiction and then break through it. Is there any way of sort of understanding contradiction in the way that channels this failure of identity in a way is that you don't have to presuppose it at the outset? Or do we just have to keep failing better in the sort of Samuel Beckett sense? Yeah, it's a great question because I think that, I mean, I want to just speak to the vitalist thing first, because I think that's a really important point that, that contradict, like I do spend a couple pages against vitalism, but it's only vitalism in the sense that just like you said, that it's a pure productivity and doesn't have the negation in it. Because I think you're right that, that Hegel's sense of contradiction is invitalizing, right? It does, it does make us vital and it's the source of our vitality. So I, I think that's really important. Uh, I think we I think you have to struggle with the problem of identity. I don't think that there's a way cuz I don't think you know I don't think that there's it's possible to to overcome the problem of identity once and for all because I think any time you have a social symbolic structure there's going to be identity. It's just like there's going to be ideology. So there's always going to be this this need to struggle against the problem of identity. I think that, that, and, and that's always, there's always going to be a temptation of identity too. Like that identity will promises security promises. I'm, I'm wholeness promises all these things. And so that's why it's always going to be seductive versus something like subjectivity or contra, you know, where, where you're, you're, you're confronting this rupture all the time, you know, all the time. So I think that mm. I don't, I don't think it's possible to overcome it once and for all, but I do think, so I do think I'm, I'm, I am in favor of the Beckett fail, you know, fail again, fail better. Mm. But I do think that the, that being cognizant of that does change things. I think of the ending of this great film, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, where they, they, they know that their relationship is doomed to fail, but they're going to take the, they're going to make the failure into part of the, the project of their relationship. Mm. And I, I feel like they, they, they're like, I know you're going to do this. You're going to do that. And then they look at each other and they're like, okay. <laughs> and they just kind of embrace it. Right. And so I do think that that's something different than the end of most romantic comedies where we're just going to engage in this lie of it's all mm. going to be okay. Right. Like they, they, they have the, they, they've, they've, they've recognized the way in which the failure is part of it. And then it's different. It is different. Like, I think, I mean, for me that like the way I, I think about, I often think of Hegel as kind of self-help. So my kids will do something that's really annoying to me. Like they don't, they tend not to, I, they'll never listen to this. So they tend not to pick up, they never pick up their clothes or towels. They just leave it on the bathroom floor. And usually they use like four towels for one shower. It's just amazing. <laughs> And every time I'm like, oh, I got to, I got to pick it all up. And, but then I think like, I'm going to be so devastated when they're gone. I'm going to, so all the, so the, and, and I'll even miss this thing that seems like it's such a, 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 a chore to me. So I, I think like that just a such a little thing, but I find that just a really, uh, invitalizing, right? Like it, it just like, I, I can look at this thing that otherwise just be tedious and make it and it becomes like part of what I love in the world. So would you say that to put a finer point on your Hegelian ethics, is it embrace your symptom? Yeah, 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 yeah. When you find, I mean, but it's a dicey thing, right? Because I was thinking, so my spouse often, these are all negative things about people I live with, but let's do it. Sorry. But my spouse often will leave the lights on, you know, and I'm like, can you just put, the, but part of it is she's thinking more about other people than about like saving money and saving energy. And she's so, so it's integral to what's great about her. But, mm -hmm. but then I think like, but what if I had my, I had a, my girlfriend before her was in, like horrible person, like real, like mean, vicious. But what if I would have said to myself, well, 
her viciousness is part of I don't know what, but exactly. Yeah, yeah, like I could have ch- back. like I, if I picked if you do it at the wrong time, I think it can be incredibly you know destructive. Like it can really it can really trap you in a terrible situation. So I think it. I, I often use think about this Lacan differential between the symptom and the symptom. Like, make sure you don't just enjoy some random symptom that's actually mm. destroying your life. Make sure it's the symptom that actually is the thing that you know holds you together as a subject. So I think, but I think you're. It's an interesting, Craig, interesting question. Like, when do you do it, and when do you when do you enjoy that symptom, and when do you just say like, okay, I got to get rid of that symptom? Go ahead, Matt. You have something. So I haven't quite worked out exactly how I was going to phrase this question. So bear with me if it's not, you know, precisely articulated. Sure. Um, but I was thinking about the ways in which Hegel's sort of reception, particularly in Western Europe, has changed. Let's say sort of the last seventy years since about nineteen fifty, end of the Second World War. Um, because what, of course, after that you have um a sort of move in a lot of in a lot of places. I'm sort of move away from Hegel. Um, and I think. You know, it's been often said that uh, more recently Zizek has played a pretty big role in sort of bringing him, bringing Hegel back as a sort of major and mainstream figure in sort of political thought. And I was wondering two things. Firstly, was I was wondering where you think that that came from, um, that sort of disillusionment, particularly among a generation of sort of French philosophers who um, took steps away from Hegel, where we're talking Deleuze, Foucault, uh, Lyotard, etc., um, and secondly, um, why, sh- why should we, what, what makes him so useful now? Um, if, if, if we're starting to see him return and being re- sort of re- reintegrated into left thought, what's so distinctive about Hegel that makes him you know, worth us going back to and reading again? So I think the first thing is that they, the image of Hegel was as a totalizing philosopher and totality was just seemed, oppre- it seemed to be the source of oppression. And so I think all those thinkers, to a person, saw Hegel as the enemy. Who and, and just it was it was unanimous. You know, even even people that are relatively friendly, like Adorno's his book on Hegel is relatively friendly, but he still thinks Hegel is in some way responsible for the Holocaust, right? So 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 that if those are your friendlies, then you're in big trouble. So I, I feel like that's <laughs> a that's that that's that was it was just in the air to think. Hegel totality, because I think the the totalizing dimension of Marxism was actually attributed wrongly, I think, to Hegel. So 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 even when Marx, so even so Stalinism, to distance yourself from Stalinism, part of what you did was distance yourself from Hegel. So I think that that there was a whole misconception of Hegel's thought, which he, of course, bears, I think everyone bears some responsibility for your thought being misconstrued. For one thing, he didn't know how to write. I mean, that's that's the first problem. <laughs> but but so so he bears some responsibility for that. But I nonetheless think that there there was a, a radical failure to get him right. And I think it was surrounding this idea of totality. Now, I actually think that's the reason why it's important to bring him back, because he offers us a way to think the totality which I think is absolutely exigent today in the era of global capitalism, without falling into something like authoritarianism or or mastery or these kinds of things that come with thinking the totality. Like he provides a way to think the totality with the openness of negation and contradiction and and rupture. And, and so I think that he he seems to me to be the thinker for today for precisely because of the structure of capital and the way he provides a diagnosis and a way to oppose it but also because in the wake of the marxist you know the the failure of the different marxist projects i think it's it, it seems like there's a a yearning for a different kind of project and one of the things that i think it is is a danger is that the left can get bogged down in just various particularisms right and i think that the, hegel provides an antidote for that in a way that is compelling. I think it's compelling. What I find interesting is people have found it compelling that are across broadly on the left. You know, Hegel's hard, of course, so there's that is a is a barrier. But I, I nonetheless th- see a lot of people coming to him. I, I mean, it's amazing the number of people that contact me and just want like, can you 
help me get through the phenomenology, <laughs> like just things like that. Like it just <laughs> like I get one email a week, two emails a week, just people asking that. So so that's pretty I, I, I mean, that really hardens me. So I don't know if that's an answer, but I think in some way he's speaking to the to the current situation for people. If Hegel is going to be the figure that could potentially provide unity for the left, how could Hegel do so without making recourse to Marx or the Marxism of the 20th century? Yeah, I think he ha- I think we have to. Like I think that I think Marx's analysis of capitalism is still pretty much unsurpassed, right? Like I don't think Hegel has an analysis of capitalism. So mm. so I think that the only thing I would add is this and I think this to me this is my I, I, I love Marx, and, and, and even despite what <laughs> the book seems like, but I, I, Marx is very important to me. Mm-hmm. But, but I think, think Marx's worst error was to think, and it, this is, only occurs in the 1844 manuscripts, although it's, I think, implicit in, the, in, in Capital and Grandrissa, that to think that capital alienates us, and that's the problem with it. Mm. Because I think, isn't the, to me, the Hegelian problem with capital is that it doesn't allow us to recognize our alienation. And that that, to me, the the project of the left should be, let's recognize how we're alienated against the capitalist imperative not to confront your alienation ever. So that to me, that's the real, it's not that we're alienated from our labor or whatever, because being alienated from the product of one's labor can be freeing, right? Like, like I don't like I've worked the job where all I did was just sit there and type in and it was fine. It was actually liberating because I could think about Hegel while I was typing in the thing and I did, didn't matter to me. So I don't think like the that to me, that's not alienation. To me, what capitalism does is alienates us from our or, or refuses to allow us to recognize our alienation. And that's the error of it. And that's where I think Hegel can help allow us to intervene. My follow-up to that would be then, well, how is that possible given that we mentioned the premise that the prospect of recognizing something, well, at least in terms of mutual recognition, would fail? How is it that we could adequately recognize our own alienation? Well, I think mutual recognition fails, but I think we can, I think Hegel does think we can reconcile ourselves to contradiction, we can reconcile mm. ourselves to alienation. This is a it's a hugely important word for him. The word the German word is Verzunung, and it 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 just means reconciliation. And that I think that that could have been in the subtitle of the book or something. Because that I think that so that is different than recognition. That so it is it is possible to reconcile yourself to your alienated state, to your to the the contradictions of the society, but it can't. But that's not the same as mutual recognition because it doesn't involve a relation to another subject. Do you think that cashes out in a lot of the same ways that Zizek notes? Like, for example, he'll say, like, yeah, I, I want a little bit of alienation in my life. I don't want to be going to party meetings all the time. Or do you have another idea about that? No, I think that's fine. I just don't think he goes far enough. I think we need a lot of alienation in our lives. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Matt, you have something. I was just going to add that... Um... The concept of alienation, Marx, always seemed to me the one that there's this really strange ambivalence on once you get past those manuscripts. Um, And, of course, in the fragment on machines from Mugundisa, in that one, he seems to make the argument in a relatively explicit way that, in fact, perhaps what we need to do is intensify that alienation to the point at which man and and the machine is almost entirely separate, such that labor as a kind of thing that we do as humans simply just stops to stops existing. So it's alienation at its most intensified right, right. in a certain way. And then that gets dropped a little bit and it's still there in capital, but not always clearly. He said it, it's always fair, but it, I, I think he, later on he gets a little bit more ambiguous about that question. Right. Right. I mean, it's, 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 he's clearest I, I, from the 1844 manuscripts. It's yeah. clearest. I think that he's against yeah. right. And, and Fremdung or in Deutschring, like he both are yeah. bad. But 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 you're right. That fragment from the Grundrisse is pretty is pretty interesting. I I've it's I've had a, little arguments with my Marxist friends about that very fragment because they're they're like, well, Marx thinks the machine is always oppressive, and I'm like, no, he doesn't think that right. at all. Like that, it's clear from that he doesn't think that at all. And I think you're right. Like there is this sense of a kind of a freeing alienation in that in that section. Yeah, it almost feels as though. 
Marx gets close when he's super young and then gets really close in the preface of Capital where he, you know, in, in the ruthless critique of, of everything in existence, like the target is the ability for this constituency to grasp something that, that Marx believes that they aren't. And that's where you sort of get this beginning of a sort of intellectual vanguardism. And then in the preface to Capital, we get the reversal of the magic cap Perseus wears. But you're right, like, alienation does like he gets so close uh to actually being able to like and even in the 1844 manuscripts where there are like six different forms i probably get the number wrong um but uh the marxists will yell at me because that's always like the claim is like you don't understand this or that's page but um <laughs> I, it almost feels like what there needs to be is actually a kind of either the, the question is do we return to hegel properly or the alternative that we get in Folks like Althusser is like, what if what if we just take a different track and choose Spinoza? So instead, it comes down to these like fundamental problems at the heart of of Marx's uh, relationship to uh, to metaphysics. Um, so I think that uh, I think that that's a great point. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I think that that's but that Althusser would be part of this. What we're talking about what what Matt asked me about this twentieth century retreat from from Hegel, right? Like that he's just part and parcel of that, and that maybe the mean the main leader of that of that retreat, right? Because he's trying to create a Marxism to completely stripped of Hegel. Yeah, which is like history is, with no subject, right? Well, then what is like right? What is right. There? I mean, I, I you know. Uh, Kochev has this great line about Spinoza when he says the ethics would be perfectly correct as a book, but no one could have ever written it. And I always think that about Althusser, like, okay, yeah, maybe you're exactly right, but no, you, no one could write it, right? Like there's no position for someone to write that book. So I, I think that that's the same, it's the same problem, just like you said, of subjectivity. I mean, absolutely. The critique of Spinoza is actually one of my favorite things about the book, because in the critique, in the sort of injection of negativity into substance you kind of get an explanation of subject as substance or you know substance as subject right. in a sense of substance is immediately subjected to its own inner indeterminacy in the initial dialectic of well the initial process of being to nothing and then producing the becoming that then foregrounds the dialectic and you you say this has a very anti-authoritarian action in injecting negativity into substance and essentially providing this great horizontal flattening in which every single being is in the same boat as a subject, you know, God, substance. It's all fundamentally negative negativity. And I think this really cuts to the heart of Hegel's work. I mean, if I could choose one part of Hegel to be read other than the master-slave dialectic, it would be the part on revealed religion. <laughs> I think yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. you really get it. Yeah. But insofar as religion this ends up being um, sort of completely sublated at the end when you move from religion to the logic and you both happens at the end of phenomenology as well as at the end of the encyclopedia and all this sort of stuff is jettisoned into a pure absolute form i mean it's after hegel can we really maintain the use of representation uh, in in a way that's sort of politically or logically productive if we already know that this representation has been undermined i mean the sense of you know is it would be would keeping representation sort of restore a semblance at least of substantiality of authority it's like you know if after we have this christian religion where god is dead and we only have the community of believers who keep it alive would there be a kind of um, ironism and hegel does warn about ironism in the final section of the encyclopedia yeah. to keeping representation rather than doing it away with it, with it entirely so as we don't accidentally allow these sort of set semblances to come back I think this is what yeah, Stern is talking about when talking about the spooks of um, the, the, the man, you know, the human, the people sort right, of thing. Right, right. So the, 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 the danger would be that the representation would be taken as substantial again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I see that, I guess. One of the most interesting things to me is the number of, of Christian ministers who've contacted me about this book and have, and like think and, and like structure sermons on the basis mm. of Hegel's thought. And so, I, I'm, 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 I guess more sanguine about that. The other thing that Hegel really thought, and I, I mean, maybe, he, maybe he's just an elitist on this, but he just thought that, that people that have jobs that have, you know, they mm. just can't, they can't read, <laughs> they can't read Hegel, right? They just, they just don't have the time to do it. And so the, their way of doing what philosophers mm. do has to be through representation. 
Mm. So it can be like, I, I think it can be, I don't think it even has to be like, I think you could watch sports in this way, right? Like sports, a lot of people say sports is a religion in America, right? Or it certainly, I mean, Britain sports has the same kind of <laughs> Absolutely. Effect, but <laughs> but it, the problem is it's not recognized as that. Like the, mm. we don't see the way in which what we're doing is acting as a community of believers, right? And so I think that that, I guess there's always the danger you point out, but I, I think that the risk is worth running for the reason that it 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 provides something that I think otherwise people aren't going to get. I think you cannot, like I've 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 I, many many summers I've worked you know eight to mm. more jobs and and I just couldn't even I could barely get enough energy to read a little novel like it. So mm. <laughs> I it's it, you know maybe in some ideal utopia we can get to a point where everybody can read Hegel, but I I just think I think we need representation as a way to 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 be speculative when we're not doing philosophy like i think re representation yeah. certain representations are speculative thinking right and that we we mm -hmm. just don't perceive them as such and we should yeah i mean i i admit i mean one of the episodes we did for the show was and we have a science series called concepts in focus and one of the things i did do was use uh, your book condensed dialectics into representation of a magnet so i couldn't go full anti-representation <laughs> myself but, um, <laughs> sorry, Matt, you wanted to say something. So you, you mentioned like sports, for example, as a sort of national religion, but, but not really understood as such, even if it functions in that sort of that sort of mm -hmm. way. And I recall, I can't remember which chapter it was in, but I was as I was reading through uh, uh, chapters from your book, I remember there was, a, there was a part where you mentioned or referenced Althusser's um, theory of ideology um, and the ideological state apparatuses. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was wondering, so you seemed a little bit like critical um, of his approach to ideology. Um, am I right in thinking that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was wondering yeah. how how would yeah, you prefer we think about that, ideology? I mean, that, that seemed like a good example of a way in which sports serve to sort of further certain ideological ends about national unity and, and pride and so on. How, how sure, should we think about sure. that with Hegel rather than with Althusser? So Althusser, I think my problem is that there's no subject in his conception of ideology, right? Like, so to me, I would say ideology interpolates subjects into symbolic identities. And so that would be what I would say. Um, for thinking about sports Hegelianly, I think you have to think about the way in which they both are emancipatory and ideological at the same time, right? Like they, so, so the way in which they, just like you were saying, the way they, they nationalize us, the way they get us all in a fervor about the national team, totally ideological. But then for just one aspect of sport, right? The, the the notion of the miracle, like we, I think a lot of people watch sport to to see miracles happen, right? Like they, mm. like an amazing kick, an amazing, you know, like the- The Hail Mary pass. The Hail Mary pass. Yeah, yeah. like it's <laughs> it's incredible, right? Like there was just just uh, a week ago, and well, I, I'm a big fan of American football, and, and there was a kicker who, like, playing for a team that I totally root against, but he was trying the longest kick ever kicked and he, and he kicked it, it hit the bar and bounced over. And I was, I was ecstatic. Like I, even though it was totally against my own self-interest as a fan and my, my son also same, and we're just hugging each other. It's, and so like, that's a secular miracle. And so I think that to think, to dismiss sport as just ideological fails to see how the investment of people in sport is partly ideological and, and phantasmatic, but it's also that has this, other dimension to it. So I think for me, that's the Hegelian that you you always have to kind of see the way in which the thing that's negative also has this is this expression of something of something else. I mean absolutely just to give an example of oh sorry I just got a really good example in terms of sport from the England national football team where essentially the team are some of these sort of slightly more uh left leaning uh young younger men who are sort of getting the eye of all these columnists but at the same time the nation represent is at the same time something which is very oppressive to them. I mean, the chant is "It's coming home," which which isn't as catchy as "It's coming back to the ethical substance of uh, of life," right. <laughs> but it has that same no, fun right, it has that same right. duality of function. But sorry. right, right, yeah, that's great. That's a great example. Yeah. 
Well, Todd, I was going to say, just riffing off of your example of the kicker, as a Deleuzian, that's exactly how I read your book here. I'm typically rooting against Hegel, but you did such a fine job explicating <laughs> Hegel here. I was rooting for you the whole time. Oh, and so, yeah, the, the Hegelian moment overcame my Deleuzian uh, commitment. Over so well, that's, a, that's my, the best compliment I've ever got on the book. Thank you. <laughs> We've got him. You might have converted Craig from a Deleuzian over to, over to oh, Hegel, Simon wow. Magnet, as Adam put. That's it. Easy now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think we're almost at the hour here. Is that right? Let me let me check our time here. I don't I don't want to keep Give you too long. To, yeah. But um oh uh, did, was there something else that I, we wanted I to ask? One question that I wanted to just, just follow follow up go a little bit on. Yeah. Um, and this maybe gets us in the weeds a little bit, but I, I'm just interested in in where, where you go with this. So you said that um the way you'd prefer to think about ideology uh, in contrast to Althusser would be that there's um there's a subject which is interpolated into a symbolic order um so there's a sort of a so if you're there's a sort of like a pre pre-ideological subject um which which is then no interpolated into no i uh, wouldn't say it that way okay i wouldn't say it that way no what i would say is the symbolic structure that the subject only emerges through it's it's interpolation, right. right? So it's so it's not like oh, first I'm a subject, then I'm interpolated. Right. It's only through that interpolation because I don't exist outside the social, right. the social. Oh, okay, order. that makes more. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and it, but, but also, okay, so otherwise it seems like I yeah no, I do not think there's first right. a subject and then there's a social yeah. order. No, no. So one of the quotes you cite for uh, the ground in contradiction is uh, when Hegel says in Science of Logic's later sections on the concept that it's the essential moment of the concept. And I'm wondering, is there a space for a kind of um, sort of almost a meta level to contradiction insofar as where, where would one go to the conceptual level, level of the concept? Because one of my sort of considerations is in terms of so when I read The Future of Hegel, I can do control F. Contradiction is very, very scarcely um, not, not really there. It's all, it's all difference. Um, but then you have the unity of identity and differences, these, these aspects of contradiction, which is the motor of the plasticity, which I think... Uh, both of your work sort of serve as a kind of uh, unity of a not a mutual corrective isn't the right term, but you know they, they work very well together. Together, could, right? Could, could I think you that's say right. that in one sense, plasticity could be the conceptual level of the concept of which the collapse of the ident self identical essence, you know, it, it fates itself the founder, and contradiction yeah. is the very motor of that. You can't get beyond contradiction because that's what's driving the whole thing. But right. overall, it's I, I, this formative, formative process which can you know totalize, but in this very open closed way <laughs> yeah no i think i totally agree with that i totally agree with that that plasticity kind of names that the, i mean i didn't think of that when i wrote the book obviously or i would have said it but i think that that i think that's right i think it's right yeah so todd i just wanted to say thank you before we close things out and l let me just say something about the book in general i really like this book from a pedagogical standpoint you're very kind to the reader you give folks lots of hairs to chase, but not so many as to overwhelm them. And I feel very immersed throughout reading it the whole time. I never really lose interest. And I think this would suffice not only to be a way to remediate one's reading of Hegel, but also to introduce somebody to Hegel and to provide a, a challenge to existing conceptions of Hegel. So nice work. Well, I just thank you. To say That's that. really, thanks a lot. That's really um, now, I know that you have some seminars coming up. I, I recently retweeted something on my account, uh, the Insight Seminars. Do you want to say something about that before we go? Yeah, I think it starts next Tuesday or this Tuesday, actually. So it's going okay. to be on my uh, on Emancipation After Hegel, this book. And then we're going to work through four different, like Hegel's The Preface to Phenomenology, Marx's The Commodity Chapter of Capital, a chapter from Lacan's subversion of the sub chapter from the Acree, the subversion of the subject uh, Acree, and then a chapter from Slavoj's uh, Sex and the Failed Absolute. So just kind of bringing some things together and and reading them in conjunction with my book. So yeah, so that's that's going to be I'm going to be doing that. So all right, I'll throw a link uh, in the in the show notes wherever people are listening, and hopefully we can have you back in the future. I mean, I'm just riffing right now, but I'd love to talk about Hegel, Freud, and maybe anti Oedipus at some point. Oh, that, that would be, be great. Yeah, hopefully we can keep it without any fireworks. <laughs> uh, sure, or maybe just a few. Maybe a little one. Yeah. yeah, yeah.